Hi, this is Paul, and I've got a special guest on with me today, Kale Zeldin, coming from Rhode Island, a place that I know fairly well. I have a niece that lives there. My mother lives just over the border in Whitensville. And um, it's a, I asked Kale for this conversation because I read his piece and um, really uh, was really impressed by it and really touched me and thought that you know, we were, we would have something to talk about. So thank you so much for being willing to come on today, Kale. My pleasure. You know, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, I, I, I've i often joked in my many walks, uh, listening to your podcast that, you know, you from time to time make reference to uh, being able to talk to randos on, on YouTube or randos on Twitter. And I'm pretty excited to be one of your randos today. So, <laughs> right. uh, it's, it's a real pleasure, honestly. Thank you for having me on. Well, why don't we begin as, as I usually begin, and why don't you introduce yourself and especially pay some attention to your faith development, especially as that very much relates to the, the, the piece that you wrote. Yeah, no, that's great. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Louisiana native. I was born in New Orleans. Um, and I'm a cradle Catholic. Um, a little bit of a funny story in that. My mom and dad were married in 1968. And my mom is a Catholic and my dad was um, uh, a non-practicing Jew. And so um, it's pretty unusual back, even even in 68, it's after the council, of course, but even in 1968, it was pretty unusual for a, for a, a Catholic girl to marry a non-Catholic boy, uh, even in New Orleans. But at any rate, they got married. Um, I'm the second of three boys. And my mom is, she's interesting. I mean, she's a, she is a really scripturally soaked Catholic, which is a little bit uh, of an anomaly. I didn't quite appreciate that growing up. I mean, I knew it, but I didn't understand really what that meant. And she was also uh, charismatic. Um, and so, and even then I didn't fully understand what all that was. Um, when my oldest brother was going through his first communion, um, my dad, the, 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 the parish priest found, um, found out that my dad wasn't Catholic and so kind of coaxed him into the fold. Um, and so, uh, so we've been a, you know, we've been a serious Catholic family growing up. Um, although, you know, but, but deeply sort of culturally Catholic too, if, if, that, if that resonates with you. And so, you know, we went to Catholic schools and I went to a Catholic high school and um, around 16, I decided that uh, I no longer wanted to be a member of the Catholic church. Um, I was much more comfortable being a member of the Church of Rolling Stone magazine and, and all of that. I was, I was really into music um, and really into sort of like, in, in, a, in a retro way, because we're talking about this is the, the late 80s, early 90s. Um, you know, uh, sort of retro into the into the musical revolution, the sexual revolution stuff of, of the 60s and 70s. And um, sort of, you know, I kind of enjoyed leaving leaving the church. I don't think I was an atheist. I was probably more of an agnostic if I if I don't know if I would have had words for it um, for it then. Um, but really, the, 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 the gospel that I grew up with, and I'm talking about in the classroom, because I went to Catholic school all the way from kindergarten through, through high school, um, was very post-council, very, you know, in, in Catholic circles, we call it the kind of felt banner, hippie church of the 70s and 80s. And, um, and I sort of, I'm not, not that I'm like massively intelligent, but I'm, I'm, I'm very observant, and I sort of put two and two together that the gospel that they were talking about in class and that I sort of absorbed was really a kind of a social social justice gospel. And so I was like, well, I mean, I can kind of do that and not have to wake up on Sundays. Um, and so I, that's what I sort of decided to do. This was, you know, caused a great um, ruckus in the family dynamic. Um, but I was pretty adamant about it. And I would say for about two and a half year, years, sometime early on as, in junior and high school, and then through my first semester of my college years, I went to LSU, the, the local um, state, state college, still a big fan of the college, of course. Um, but it was there that I started reading, like really reading stuff. Um, you know, I encounter, I, I, I joke that it's sort of three books, three authors that kind of jolted me out of my sort of bigotry 
I would say, you know, that I had, I had adopted my cultural bigotry and it was Homer, um, uh, C.S. Lewis um, and Augustine. And I was reading that in, in the, I was reading Homer and Augustine in my honors college classes at LSU. And uh, a friend, uh, a friend of mine, uh, my, my best friend, um, was an evangelical Christian, which was a little strange because he was in a Catholic school. And um, so he was a tremendous influence on me um, and really saved my faith at a crucial moment in my, in my freshman year. I, I, he, you know, cause he, he's smarter than I am. He was certainly much better read than I was. And uh, anyway, the long and short of it is uh, Homer, um, I remember after reading Homer, my 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 professor. Um, this was at a you know secular college, but I found out later on he was a kind of conservative Anglican, which is where those kind of people hang out in at state colleges, right? The honors colleges. It's a great books program type thing. And he said at the end of Homer, and he was a great teacher, and he really brought it alive. And he said, "Yes, you know, um, you know what Homer accomplished in the Iliad has never been um, topped." And it really like graded on me like right away. Like, what do you wait wait? And then I. I sort of, he said, now it's been equaled, like, you know, and he references Dante and Shakespeare and, and, and Dostoevsky and others, but, but it's never been topped. And I remember that really bothered me, deeply, deeply bothered me, because I just presumed that, look, we're in the 90s, you know, um, we, we're, we're smarter, better, you know, the, you know, that whole sort of myth of progress thing that I had yeah. drunk deeply from. And it really caused me pause. And I recognized that, you know, I really had my work cut out for me. Um, you know, I remember confronting you know like well Shakespeare like he's a really smart guy he's a really accomplished guy he's the you know the artist of artists and you know I'm pretty sure he probably believed or or certainly didn't traffic in the kind of unbelief that I was entertaining and so that was really I, I this is going to be a funny story I've never told anybody this but but Dinesh D'Souza of all people wrote a book called um like Catholic classics or Christian classics it basically goes through all of these people in history who were were Christian and that really blew my mind because these were smart guys. I knew that I couldn't, you know, I could dismiss my mom. I can dismiss my dad. I could dismiss the ex-seminarians who taught me um, religion in, in, in high school, but I couldn't, I couldn't really reject these guys. I had to take it seriously. And so I really did a deep dive. And based upon that, I decided to transfer to a, a Catholic Great Books Liberal Arts College up in New Hampshire. Um, and did a real deep dive in the great books. And I had some great teachers and, you know, we read all the, all the big stuff, you know, all the main, the main great books. And then a lot of the sort of the, the upper echelon secondary sources. And that was a, a huge part of my conversion. And so for me, my intellectual conversion was all of a piece, um, you know, and, and Lewis's abolition of man in particular was very impactful on me with all of this. That was the third that I mentioned. Um, and then, you know, that was it. I mean, I, 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 once I became intellectually convinced that there was some there there, um, that I, I, I really, I really took a deep dive, you know, came back into the church and, you know, ate crow with my family and that was fine. I and mean, they were cool about it. Um, you know, but you know, that, that was where, and then I went to graduate school and that was a great experience too, because I really had to, you know, uh, so I went to a Catholic liberal arts, I finished up at a Catholic liberal arts college, then went back to the state school and, you know, I'm reading Foucault and Derrida and Guattari and all the postmoderns. And it was great experience because I really had to own where I was coming from pretty quickly. And then on the church front, um, you know, it was primarily an intellectual thing for me. Um, but, you know, I look over my shoulder and I mentioned this in the piece, I look over my shoulder and, you know, you've got a veritable rock star sitting in the chair of Peter, right? You know, with John Paul II. Yeah. And he's really the only Pope that I knew at that point. I mean, I literally remember the sitting in the living room, watching my mom watch the announcement of, you know, Habemus Papam with, uh, with John Paul II. That was a very early memory for me. Or I was around five years old. Um, so really my, so up until that point, he's all I knew. And not only was he this sort of towering physical presence who traveled the world and, you know, I went to, he came to New Orleans at some point and I went, went to that. Um, but he was also an intellectual giant. Um, you know, he was the real deal. He was no um, dabbler. I mean, he, no. he was a but a philosopher in his own right and yep. historian in his own right. And so that was huge for me. And so that's sort of how my, my intellectual uh, and, and so my intellectual and spiritual journeys are really coterminous. So 
moving into then your career, yeah. um, you've sure. been teaching, you've been teaching for how many years now? Uh, that's a good question. So I, um, so, uh, so right after, um, so I went to graduate school. So I graduated in, I think, 97. I wrote my master's thesis. I have MA in English from LSU. Okay. Actually wrote it in poetry. Um, and then I uh, went back up to the college and taught for a couple of years and worked in student life and went back down to Louisiana and actually wrote for a golf magazine for a year. <laughs> Because uh, I love golf too, which is another addiction, including <laughs> what I have that I have with Twitter, and um, and then I taught at my old high school for two years, uh, which was a great experience. Um, you know, I don't, you know, Baton Rouge is sort of like a big, small town, and so you know, you kind of know everybody, and that was good. But they said, Kale, we love you, but you know, if you're going to stick around, um, you're going to have to." Um, uh, get certified. And I was like, yeah, I'm not really interested in, in getting my teacher certification. And I've always loved movies and television. And I had been kicking around the idea, well, like, well, how about like, I want to write those things. Those are great, you know. So I, I and this is this is where my story kind of gets interesting from an evangelical standpoint, because um, I got involved with a group called Act One Writing for Hollywood, which is a sort of an interdenominational um, uh, program for writing and producing in Hollywood, which I still think is operative. And, and the director uh, was a was a is a was a woman. Sorry, uh, she's now um, no longer there. But her name is Barbara Nicolosi. Actually, she just wrote the movie Fatima uh, that that just came out. At any rate, so she um, was a, a huge influence on me because she sort of was looking to make some inroads. You know, I was familiar with the great books world and the intellectual world and how does that intersect with pop culture? And so, so she was this sort of Catholic intellectual, you know, force of nature that was running a largely evangelical group in Hollywood. And this is right around the time of like the emergent church and ecclesia and all that sort of stuff of which I knew nothing about as, as, as a Catholic. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so I became very conversant and comfortable um, uh, with, with, with the evangelical world back. So this was in around 2000, two, three, four, five. I was there. I was there. I lived and worked in Hollywood for five years. In that time I met my wife. Um, and we got married, and at the at time um, we were expecting our first child. An old friend of mine, who had, who was working out here in Rhode Island, said, "Hey, Kale, there's a job out here. I think you'd be really interested. It's a boarding school, and we have a great books program." And I'm like, "Yeah, thanks, but no thanks." And anyway, I went up talking to the headmaster, and there, you know, I've got my wife, I've got a new baby, and I'm like, you know, I probably should think this through. Um, and so anyway, we, we came out here and I've been here. Uh, I just finished my 13th uh, school year. So. Wonderful. And so you teach great books? I do. Yeah, I teach great books. And um, yeah, I do a variety. I coach. I do a bunch of other things out here. But yeah, my the draw for me is, I, you know, the real thing that I love is, is the great books. You know, so okay. in, a, in a few short days here, I'll be starting with Dante's Inferno with another group of, with another group of kids. So it's exciting. And, it's, and you're teaching high school age kids? I am, yeah, yeah. So it's an ambitious course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dante's yeah. Inferno, not an easy book. Well, well, talk to me about what you're seeing in, because, you know, on my channel, we've done a lot of talk about the meaning crisis. Just yeah. last week, I had a conversation with a young man, and part of, he's a college student now, but part of what shocked me is he said, you know, I read Camus in middle school, and I thought. Yeah, yeah I saw that, I saw that piece. I watched it yesterday, and uh yeah, precocious guy, you yeah. know, and, and, you know, that's, yeah, and, and I, I was struck by your comment, you know, you said about your own kids that they sort of are reading things sooner, and, and I think yes. there's probably a truth to that, um, but, uh, but I still think him reading Camus is a little bit, it makes him a, a touch of an outlier, <laughs> if, uh, if, uh, you know. But, um, but yeah, no, I mean, and this is, you know, I, I teach at a Catholic school, and so there's a certain home uh, quality that we're reading, you know, I do. So me and a, a, a team, me and my team teacher teach sort of concurrently, like I'm doing Dante and he's doing uh, the letter to the Romans. And then I do Sir Gowan and the Green Knight and he's doing Augustine's Confessions. And then I'm doing Chaucer and he's doing uh, some Aquinas, you know, so it's a kind of a hop, skip and jump through the, 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 the Western sieve. Um, and then we'll move on and do Shakespeare and Milton's Paradise Lost and, 
he's doing Locke and and Moore's Utopia and Descartes and Pascal. I mean, so it's a it's a so it's a course that takes the place of their history course, their theology course, and their English course. Okay, would it would it be fair to say that in some ways you're uh, living in a um, at least a Roman Catholic version of Dreer's Benedict option? I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm very familiar with, with Rod's stuff and yeah. um, I've corresponded with him a little bit throughout the years. And, you know, um, I know, I mean, I don't want to get into it too much here, but no, I wouldn't say, I mean, look, we are a very mainstream upper echelon. We serve the elite. I mean, do a quick Google search and you'll know it, it's super expensive. So I don't, I don't think I would say it like that, Paul. Okay. I mean, it's a, you know, I'm very familiar. I've, I've been part of sort of proto Benedict option communities and I'm very drawn to that, but I don't think that that's really what, what, what this is here. Even though I, I think that Rod's ultimately right. Just put my cards on the table. Yeah. Well, I was, you know, because when I first, you know, I, had, I followed his blog before, I mean, it was actually, it was Rod Dreer that sort of tipped me off to Jordan Peterson. That's yeah. where I found Peterson initially so through. You and I probably got tipped off to Peterson the exact same day, which was the 18th <laughs> of January, 2018, because I saw the Kathy Newman thing on his blog. And that's what started my dive into, into the IDW. Yeah, no, I found, I found Dreer back uh, earlier than that. It was in 27, yeah. or I found, I found Peterson in 2017. Yeah. And he had had a couple of small, comments about him but you just know, during I, the whole c16 thing yeah in the aftermath yeah, of okay. c16 yeah i ignored that stuff i'll tell you why in a minute yeah, yeah. so but it was but it was interesting when i when i you know when i found when i you know started you know kind of processing Dreer's benedict option because i had felt that in the christian reformed church um, we had in some ways lived the benedict option up until the Second World War, and after the Second World War, the Christian Reformed Church sort of took down all its walls, and and the the war had that, the war and you know in many respects had that effect. Scholars, you know, young CRC youth who had grown up in rural places, you know, joined the military, and in the military were introduced to this whole big world. The Christian Reformed Church had very much been a a group of people that emphasized Christian education. And so you could be Christian reformed and just stay within Christian reform institutions yeah. all the way up through. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that the, um, I mean, the Roman Catholic church, obviously far, far larger um, community, far more ancient, obviously, but in America, you know, obviously also its own very different history via yeah, like, but, but I would say on that, Paul, I mean, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I, I think I sent you an email, like the thing that I've been chewing on is tribe and creed in my head, mm -hmm. this sort of tension, right? And, and you know, uh, I don't want to get down too much of a rabbit hole, like with Latin and, and, and pre-council, post-council stuff, but I'll, I'll just say this, like, you know, I grew up entirely in the wake of the Second Vatican Council. Like, I have zero memory of Latin, you know, uh, you know, we, you know, I, the, the, the mask was changed when, um, you know, five years, I think, before I was born. So I have no memory, lived memory of that. But if you look at, at Kath, like, it was a real tribal world. I mean, like, for instance, there's a town right around the block from me in Bristol, and there are three Catholic churches that are literally within walking distance of one another. You've got St. Mary's, which is like the sort of the French and, and Irish parish. You've got St. Elizabeth's, which is, which is Portuguese. And then you've got um, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which is the Italian parish. Now, this is a tiny little town and it's all around the village green right there. And so now you sort of, you know, for me as a post-count conciliar uh, react person, you know, you sort of scratch your head like, well, wh why would they have done this? Well, you know, you, you dig a little bit. I mean, you know, the Italian Catholic Church and the Irish Italian Church and the Portuguese Italian Church and the French, you know, that was something not part of my world, but there's still an existent sort of memory of all of that stuff. And, and, and you know, and it's hard to tell like what caused what, but 
but those tribes were still very much, I mean, like if you think of the Italian American church in this little town in Bristol, I mean, how different is that really from a CRC yeah. community that was, you know, yeah. 15 miles outside of town yeah. in Rehoboth, Massachusetts, right? I mean, yeah. I, I can't imagine it, it's actually that different. Yeah. Obviously differences with class and sort of, um, interest if it's rural and farming versus you know professional or pre-professional i mean those things can make differences but i i think those little tribes um did in fact exist but in catholicism i think those tribes were utterly obliterated um mm. with with the second vatican council i mean you know which is ironic because you would think well latin you know would yeah. be the thing yeah. but, but ironically i think that what it really did was it just destroyed um uh, uh, uh ethnic tribes within the larger tent of catholicism which i think then precipitated the, the or helped bring about it's sort of the dissolution that we see now that's fascinating that's i mean part of what what part of i mean to be to have grown up in such a you know small tribe like the christian reformed church um, you know, when you think of something like the Second Vatican Council that just, you know, the, the Catholic Church is just so massive that whoosh. So, so. Overnight. I mean. Yeah, overnight. Essentially, I mean, historically speaking, overnight. It, it's still required. I mean, to, to have that kind of. Well, 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 talk to me a little bit more about that, because, you know, at some point we have to get into the piece that you wrote. Yeah, yeah. Because. You know, I recently watched uh, Bishop Barron uh, made a video about Vatican II, and he was he was he was chiding, um, seemed to be American uh, yeah, neo-traditional conspiracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and it you know, this is a fascinating. I mean, just if, if uh, did you read uh, um, the ape who um, uh, understood the universe? No. Uh, the book on evolutionary biology by Steve Stewart Williams. The no. premise of the book is, you know, basically this this alien comes in from from outer space who knows evolutionary psychology, evolutionary uh, theory, and comes down and he kind of watches the Earth, right? And so he could kind of do this, you know, this sort of experiment, and it's you know, and whatever anthropology or sociology or, or whatever it is. And and I, why did I go here? Because. Um, What's going on in, in, in with Barron and, and all these other folks right now is really, really fascinating. But most people are, don't, they, they really can't see because it, you know, it's kind of this weird intertribal fight. But I think it's very important, actually. Well, tell me more. Yeah. You've really got me, you've really got me fat yeah. because I listened to the piece and I thought, this is so interesting. But as, you know, with, with the little CRC place that I live, so often CRC people are talking to each other and it's like, they're talking to each other, but others are overhearing and it's like, you don't really know what they're yeah, saying right. to each other. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll be that, I'll try to be that guide for you. And obviously I'm biased and I have my sure. own prejudices and whatnot, but sure. anyway, so, so again, so think of me growing up. So like in, you know, 19, you know, 78, when, when Carol Wattie was, is, is named Pope, is elected Pope, you know, there had really been this interesting fight between like the sort of the radical reformers and the kind of conservative reformers. And there's, there still is this fight over who owns the council, right? And the, is the council the documents? Is the council sort of like the spirit? There's all this kind of fight, right? So, so for, for the entirety of, uh, of, of, of John Paul II's, you know, those early fights, if you really dig into that stuff, you can see that he's fighting the sort of the progressive element of the reformers, right? And so his, and there are groups like there's like, I think it's Communio is the conservative reformers and Liberatio is, I forget the other, the name of other, the, my, the trad, my trad friends are going to kill me right now. But anyway, <laughs> the, so it was largely a fight between the liberals, the sort of the capital L liberals, and it was the conservative liberals and it was the progressive liberals. The people that got completely sort of kicked to the to the curb were the trads, right? And they were essentially irrelevant and kind of the cranky people who flirted with anti-Semitism and, you know, John Birch Society stuff, all that kind of fringe element. And they'd really gotten kind of kicked out. And so it was really a fight between the conservative liberals and the progressive liberals. And so, so what happens with John Paul II's very lengthy papacy, which was, you know, 
you know, he was putting out encyclical after encyclical, which were all serious works into themselves. You know, and then with Ratzinger taking over uh, afterwards with Benedict, so they really sort of thought that they had kind of won the the war, and and I did too, as someone who is largely sympathetic. I mean, deeply sympathetic with both of them. I, I've tempered my position on this in the last couple of years. Um, but you know, I thought it was ascendant. I thought that it was, you know, we in fact we joked in the in in the conservative circles that you know we were we were playing the uh, biological option, right? And so that it was just a matter of time when all the the progressives die because not, none of they don't have any children, and you know conservatives have more kids and more priests, and they were all JP two priests, and the new evangelization was very much. An exciting thing, and 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 then boom, flush. Benedict Benedict um, um, resigns, and that's weird. And we still don't talk about how yeah. utterly bizarre this is. Yeah. And and then and then um, uh, Francis emerges, and Francis, uh, in, in essence, uh, all these people had it been kind of an institutional and ecclesial life support for twenty plus years. You know, all of a sudden, you know, they have this sort of new resurgence, and you see this, right? You see this with, with things. Now, Barron is a fascinating figure because barons don't become bishops, right? It's weird that he's huh. a bishop. You know, you always have like the main guy who's essentially a politician, right? And they run the big seeds, yeah. right? Yeah. And they tend not to be intellectuals; they tend to be managers, right? Right. Occasionally, somebody like Barron will get thrown a bone at the end of his career, kind of like the way they used to hand out Monsignors, and you know, it's sort of an honorific. But it's very interesting because he's this kind of rock star, right? And you know, he's got his channel and his outlets and Word on Fire, and it's huge and massive. And you know, and, and I think he puts out great stuff, to, to be fair. Um, but it's weird that he is um, a bishop, uh, even though he's sort of an auxiliary in a larger LA diocese, I think he's out of Santa Barbara. But it, but all of a sudden, because you have so so the reason why I put that that stuff in about McCarrick in into the piece, in, in the thing that really rocked my world is that McCarrick was a creature of the system, and I'm not talking about the the sex and the money and the abuse and all that, but he was. I mean, he was a cardinal. I mean, how many of those are in the word? Like very few. So I mean, he was a real creature of this. And for him to ascend into that position and then hold on to that position and to rise up all of his guys, that sort of pulled a lot of the scales off of my eyes about the the, the political reality of church. I mean, you know, when you've got JP2 in the chair, you're like, you're like me, you're like, oh, this is great. This is awesome. You know, we've got the equivalent of, you know, Francis of Assisi and Thomas Aquinas in one person sitting at, at, at the top chair. Like, that's cool. You know, how, how many people get, get to live through something like that? So at any rate, um, that all got changed, you know, with, with Francis and, and his various things. And I don't want to bore your audience with all the various encyclicals and whatnot, but it's definitely, it's a different church. And, you know, and um, Barron, you know, is a conservative liberal. He's not a trad. And in, and in church taxonomy, Roman Catholic taxonomy, that's a different thing. And so he's, he and his boys have really been punching down on the trads as of late, which I find very fascinating because the trads have encroached on his turf. Hold on one second. Hey, my dogs are chewing on a chew toy. I don't know if you can hear that. So he's punching down on the trads because the trads have figured out YouTube. Yeah, and, and he was really the only, he was sort of the master of, of Catholic YouTube up until about two and a half, three years ago. And, you know, so that's an interesting, you know, fighting for eyes, you know, it's- Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, Brett, yeah. Brett and Heather always talk about the gig economy and all of that. And I think that I think there's a little bit of that, but he's a bishop. I mean, he's got yeah. standing. Yeah. You know, if you're a rando who's got a YouTube channel, you might be saying all kinds of true things. But, you know, anyway, so there, that's part of that text on me. Can you just hold on one yeah. second? <laughs> you're totally killing me. Okay, girl. Sorry about that. Oh, no more squeaky toy for the dog. Yeah, yeah. I have two big dogs and they, you know, they're, they're whatever. Uh, hi, girl. 
Um, so, you know, so that is what, that is sort of the part, you know, when you were talking about Baron, you know, you're, you're, when you were talking about Baron, you were talking about modernism, which I, I really, God, I feel like I want to talk to you about that because, because that is sort of an interesting moment here. And Baron has always been able to kind of surf that, whatever that line is. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, and he got it like in the trad world, they crush him all the time because of his conversation with Shapiro, right? And if you recall in his conversation with Shapiro, yeah, yeah. he was saying, you know, Ben, to his credit, asked him point blank, well, like, do I have to be Catholic? Yeah, you know, yeah, and, and yeah, Baron yeah. really whinged on that one. If you're, you know, if you're, a, yeah. you know, an Orthodox believing Christian, he really whinged on that. And he said something about Jesus being the, um, the privileged path right? The privileged way. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so as you imagine, the trads just, you know, I mean, yeah. go on Catholic Twitter and it's like, you know, <laughs> it's like um, you know, it's, you know, they, you know, calling him a Balthazarian devil and, you know, and all this kind of stuff, you know, so, you know, that, that's a little bit of the subject there. Or the that's, that's fascinating because, you know, again, I live in such a smaller world, but this is, this is huge and long and you know for many people who who aren't roman catholic i mean i mean baron is a i mean he's a tremendously impressive figure i mean he's um he's eloquent he's he's you know clearly well read you know my conversation with um with brett sockled um you know when i was reading brett's book was fascinated by all of the, you know, but all the footnotes to uh, Bishop Aaron, it's like, I didn't know, I didn't know he had written this kind of stuff. And his, you know, his conversation with Jordan Peterson obviously displayed his, his credentials. Yeah. Now, now maybe, maybe to zip over to your piece. Yep. Um, you know, what a, I mean, when I, when I read it, it was, yeah, it was, you know, obviously you, you, I read a lot of things on the net and this, this just was sort of a, a bolt out of the blue in terms of the clarity, the honesty. Um, talk, talk to me, in my experience, at least, you know, when I do a video or back when I was writing more things, you know, often, often something, you know, not necessarily a thing, but just kind of a, a mental flow precipitates, you know, a piece like this where it seemed to me you just kind of, you know, opened your heart with respect to the church, our context, and and where the um, and I, now knowing a little bit more about your story and your background, you know, I, I can imagine I can see more. But it, but but talk to me about this. What what where did this come from for you? Yeah. So so I mean, part of it, you know. So I mentioned the McCarrick thing, and that you know has come at a, at a at the end of a very. I mean, since basically two thousand and one with Boston, and then the slow trickle and the explosions and all of that. You know, I've been, you know, and I've been that entire time, remember, I've been in sitting in front of high school students, right? And some, you know, some of my kids are cradle Catholic, some are not, but you look, I'm teaching at a Catholic school. I'm, I'm a, an, an out Catholic, you know, teaching. I self-identify <laughs> as that. It's funny it is to say that out loud. Again, I'm, I work in a mainstream world, right? And, you know, you know, if, you know, there's a certain fatigue that sets in, right? And, and, and for me, you know, one of the things that I've always loved about you, you know, you talk about like low res and high res and, and you know, and, 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 and recognizing, you know, that, you know, that, that at the end, uh, so, so when all this sort of stuff comes out and I had this sort of very simplified, like, look, you know, uh, a priest who wears his clericals and, 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 and uh, says a reverent mass good and a priest who like, you know, throws the liturgical prayers out and, and straps on the guitar and starts performing to his group bad, right? And that's in my very sort of simple Catholic, um, Catholic uh, world, my, my frame. And it slowly dawned on me that, that actually, you know, and maybe even especially the worst of the predators were the ones who would wear a cassock and could could talk Thomas and you know and 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 you know that, that there's a there's a special kind of wolf in sheep's clothing who would adopt the clothing of of overt overt orthodoxy 
uh, I mean within the Catholic Church, um, as opposed to sort of the, the, the heterodoxy of the spirit of the Vatican Council. You know, and so I realized, I knew that I had to upgrade, right? That that was not operative, but I, you don't really know who to talk to about that stuff, right? You know, you got a couple of friends who are deep readers, but you know, in the normal parish world, you know, I'm not gonna like talk to my neighbor over donuts and coffee after Sunday mass about this kind of stuff, right? So, so, so you kind of retreat into your bubble a little bit and, and you know, go about your work and you do your thing. And, and the McCarrick thing just was, it was just absolutely and utterly disgusting. And what was particularly disgusting to me is that McCarrick was the face, if you recall Dallas at the Dallas charter when they implemented zero tolerance and all this sort of, stuff, all this sort of this public displays of we are serious now, he was the face of it all, right? And, and so, and not that I ever, liked Ted McCarrick, but I, you know, I, well, he was the, the, the cardinal of, of the cardinal archbishop of, of Washington, D.C. You get a certain amount of credence to that. And to, and, and to hear about that and just to see just the, the just what a scoundrel, right? And, and then I'm like, all right, you guys knew about this stuff. I mean, I've been, I've been holding your water for a friggin' decade more. I mean, it's 2018. So for 18 years, I've been basically been like, yes, yes, a few bad apples, but the truth, Jesus is still real. The church is still real. I'm going to, and then you're like, okay, what the hell is real anymore? Like, seriously, what's real anymore? Because you guys knew he didn't do anything and you cared more about the brand than you did, you know, about the truth. You cared more about the brand than you did about these kids. And, um, you know, you just sort of, you're done. And then you start to think, all right, well, he was a creature of the successful church, right? Of the Vatican. So then you start doing this whole unravel job. I'm like, you know what? Screw you all. I'm just going to go become a rad trad because at least they've always thought that all of you were a bunch of scoundrels. And <laughs> you know, I'm just going to go be cranky with them in the corner, right? But at the same time, I stumbled across Peterson. And, and I'm just like, all right, this guy is doing some, some real things, you know? And He's not hung up on church politics, obviously, you know, he's not, you know, he, he's, but, but I was just struck by how deeply respectful he was of scripture and, and, and what the stories could possibly mean, you know, sitting through modernist homily after modernist homily for the duration of my, my liturgical life. I'm like, my, this guy takes the Bible more seriously than any of you yahoos. Yeah. um uh you know who wear the robes at mass you know yeah. and so that that so like so i just did my deep dive with that i'm like well at least he's taking it seriously because i was never like it never occurred to me to like not be christian and not to be catholic i mean that sounds weird but i'm in this sort of weird headspace even right now where like what does it mean for me to be a roman catholic who has zero faith in in the institutional church and zero faith in in you know the people who run it yet i, I yet i believe the thing you know and, and and baron you know you even made a funny joke about that as a protestant you know baron sort of in a very un, for him a very unguarded moment is that dare i say protestant you know and <laughs> And I'm like, well, that, that's interesting, you know, because that's always kind of the threat, right? That's the way that you sort of police the boundaries of orthodoxy is that, you know, what are you, Protestant? You know, that kind of thing, you know, so. Well, it, it, yeah, wow, wow. And, and so when I'm writing the piece, you know, so what, so then, okay, so, you know, so all of that kind of conservative edifice of John Paul II and Benedict XVI, all of that gets quickly unraveled because quickly you see, um, you know, the, 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 the church politicians, the bishops, very quickly sort of insinuate themselves, oh, all of a sudden they become sort of moderately progressive on X, Y, and Z. And then you start to realize, well, a lot of these guys tacked to the right with John Paul II and Benedict XVI, and now we're sort of subtly tacking to the left to sort of aggrandize themselves to, to Pope, Pope, Pope Francis. And you're like, all right, well then, you know, and I, sorry, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not doing this. And so, um, so then that's, you know, you start entertaining, you know, more and so it really opened yeah. things up for me so so I'm, I'm not only am i entertaining sort of the traditional catholicism more but i'm also doing all this idw stuff yeah. because it's so intellectually engaging to me yeah. yeah oh that's fascinating that is so fascinating you know because the i mean the strange thing 
well, as a pastor, you very you very quickly realize that there there are ladders, there are pastoral ladders, yeah. and there are climbers. And well, if I you kind of talk about this, I love yeah, I love the way yeah. you talk about this. And then, and again, I think for Catholic people, they don't quite understand how entrepreneurial the model is for Protestant pastors. Yeah. Right? You know, you you're making certain decisions. Are you going to skyrocket to a cam? What is it? The what is the the Warren type stuff or the Willows Creek, all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, the, what is the New York city guy? I always forget his name. All oh, Tim Keller. Tim yeah, Keller. They, yeah, all that yeah. stuff. Or am I going to do something really local? Well, and that, and that was, you know, that's fairly new to the Christian reformed church too, because okay? the, the Christian reformed church was for many CRC pastors, the, you know, there was a ladder and you would aspire, you would, you know, you would take a starter church and then your second church would be a place that you'd spend longer. And then you would aspire to be a denominational bureaucrat and then whatever top office there was too. Right. right. But in the, in, so, so the Christian Reformed Church basically has been within the tensions of, is the CRC evangelical or is the CRC mainline? And then the third, the third group that has emerged out of the middle, I call the, the Reformed Catholics, because suddenly I began to notice uh, 15 years ago or so, colleagues, but especially pastors younger than myself, were wanting to do things like we want to, we, we're not, they don't call it the Lord's Supper anymore, they more often call it Eucharist. And we're remembering the baptism and we're all of these things that the generation of my grandfather would have called okay. papist or yeah, yeah, no way. Right. Right. No, because well, I was, I was, I was around tables like that when I was in Hollywood in 2000, you know, four five, six, you know, I might, you know, I'm at these sort of interdenominational tables and I'm listening to all my evangelical friends talk about like Eucharist and stuff. I'm like, you guys are talking about you. I mean, I, I got a lot of this. If you want to talk about this stuff, like I'll do it all day long. I mean, like really, like you're talking about liturgy. Like, my goodness, like I'm going to have to change my whole categories here because this is not, you know, this is this does not compute. But that was about right about 15 years ago, 16 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And and so then you know now making videos and then we start this bridges of meeting Discord and I talk to the people who watch my videos because that's in many ways, the most interesting thing about this whole thing for me is, gosh, who would, who would listen to the stuff I'm putting out there and then watch everyone meet each other. And, you know, I'd have a number of people on the discord say things like, you know, they'd grown up Roman Catholic and they'd sort of left. And then after Jordan Peterson came back, but, you know, but they, they're like, and it's weird because I listened to this Calvinist pastor then and his videos yeah. and, you know, the, the little homily that we get at the mass, that's just, you know, that's, that's kind of the, they're, they're not there for that. Whereas a Protestant, of yeah. course, is there for the sermon. And, yeah. and so, and of course, then the onsla onslaught of the Orthodox, which, you know, you know, Jonathan Peugeot and, yeah, but of course. course, Peugeot raised, you know, French Canadian. And you'd think, well, surely he must have been raised Roman Catholic. No, evangelical, but then, and, and I'm just watching all this stuff happening. And it's like, what on earth is going on in this world? Yeah, it's, and, it's like this sort of interesting resort, the shuffle and resort of, of of all kinds of things. And that's kind of what I'm getting at with tribe and creed. Yes. You know, like there was sort of this, like you talk about your grandfather, right? And like your grandfather, you know, you know, couldn't have like been real friends with my grandfather, you know, on my Catholic side, because like it was just just different worlds. It's just just different worlds. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. maybe friendly, but you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, one's looking down the nose at the other as, yeah. oh, he's a papist, and the other one's looking down his nose and saying, oh, he's a Protestant, you know, and there the two shall meet, right? I mean, that just wouldn't have happened. I don't yes. Well, and, and the, in Whitensville, Massachusetts, which is not far from where you live, yeah. the Christian Reformed Church and the Roman Catholic Church are right across the street from each other, and I was blown away when one of a guy that did an internship with me and he was a church planter. And then he went and pastored my, my parents' church in Pleasant street. And he told me that, that they do, I don't remember what they called it, but they, you know, they're cooperating with the Catholics. And yeah. when I was growing up that the worst thing that could happen to any of my cousins would have been to, to meet and marry a Catholic girl, which one of them did. And, yeah, yeah, and, totally. 
and the the sea change in this and and now you know and then when i read your piece you know of course i'd followed rod Dreer's path and you know he's you know, of course, he's from Louisiana, and he grows up in that milieu, and he decides, okay, this is the this is this is the church of my roots. I want to take it seriously. And he and his wife talk about they want to, you know, practice Roman Catholic, you know, family, you know, this family yeah, framework. Yeah, he's and so the right about that. Priest rolls his eyes, and it's yeah, and he's, and he's so right about that. Oh, my, yeah, he's so right about that. So, so my question then is, it's so funny that you know, this Western Canadian who, who kind of becomes acquainted to the world because he doesn't want to say Z or, um, or them or something like this, you know, sort of takes a, takes a static, status rocket up into the sky and in his midst, all kinds of Christians separated by various traditions start coming together and talking. I mean, this is just insane. <laughs> oh, it's, it's totally insane. It's totally insane. I mean, that, that's what, you know, that's what I find, you know, like, I don't know what to make of it, you, you know, like, because look, if you look at the comments in the piece that I wrote, right, and, and, and uh, 1 Peter 5 is a trad site, right, and it's run by Steve Skodrick, he's a great guy, and a friend of mine, and a virtual friend, you know, like this, but, um, you know, he and I both knew right away that, you know, that the, the, the way that the Catholic trad tribe would respond to the piece is like, careful. Like, you know, what do you mean you can find truth outside of the walls, right? You know, you know, the church holds the fullness of the truth, right? And, and you know, and, and again, I, I get it. Like, I, I am a Catholic. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to pretend otherwise, right? But, but, but there's this, this, You know, it's it's like pious platitudes will kind of like get you through some rough patches, you know, and, and it's like, well, no, no, actually, you know, the, the, the you know, the, so that the response was like, well, you know, you're flirting, basically, Kale, you're flirting with with some dangerous stuff. And that's why I had that kind of fake confession to start off the piece, you know, it's like, you know, I've, I've logged on to the internet, and I've, I've met atheists and and mathematicians you know and i'm sort of doing a, a funny taxonomy of the idw and 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 they, they kind of make sense you know and how is it then that these guys and, and i'm you know and i'm my big my the guys that i like are you know i like jordan peterson's probably my favorite but i love eric weinstein i i, I find him just utterly fascinating brett and heather are amazing um you know, and, uh, you know, there's sort of two Ben's that you've talked about before. There's Ben the pundit and there's Ben the one who can have real conversations. And I look, I'm basically conservative. So it's not like he's saying things that I wildly disagree with on his daily podcast, let's say, but that's not, the, I don't, I don't jam on that stuff. I mean, I, I like, you know, the, the deep conversation stuff, I mean, you know, and a, a powerful witness of a man of faith, of, of deep faith and orthodoxy who lives this public life. I mean, I think I find it inspirational. Um, but at any rate, you know, um, but, but, you know, when cert with certain, you know, certain Christians, you know, they, well, this is kind of dangerous stuff. And, 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 and it's a, it's so funny, you know, like the, you know, I think the Protestants get the, a bad rap about being, you know, deeply suspicious, especially obviously fundamentalists, but being deeply suspicious of evolution. Um, and it's certainly a lot of sort of the, the public noise is, is generated by evangelical counter apologetics, right? Um, but, in, in, but, in, but in certain Catholic circles, you know, like you'll find a lot of young earthers in Catholic Facebook groups, you know, who are like, well, you know, they're lying and it's probably Jewish. And you're like, guys, like, you know, it, it, it's just, it's, you know, it's disgusting because obviously I'm, I, I identify as Jewish too. Right. And, and, um, and so I'm, it's just these weird flirtations. Like I've just never understood it, but anyway, I don't want to get down that rabbit hole. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, as Peterson himself points out early on and often, you know, look, his entire project is based on evolutionary thinking. Yeah. You know, and um, I, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I don't see the necessary conflict. And, and you know, um, I don't see that there has to be a necessary conflict um, between the two of those things. And so I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years reading 
all the evolutionary stuff I can get my hands on just because I feel like I need to be conversant in it. You know? um, so that so was part of it too. So, so where's all this stuff going? Because it's interesting because of course, Peterson has been, you know, out with all of his medical things yeah, yeah. Um, in some ways, you know, Brett has become quite reasonably possessed by, you know, what was first local to his, his life in his college and now local yeah. to him in his city. Yeah. Uh, Eric is, Eric is Eric. Okay. But, but, but so, so right after you, you, you put out that piece, you know, sort of what next with the, with the IDW and, and you mentioned that, that Eric has really sort of taken up the baton, but I don't know if you've noticed this, but like in the last three or four weeks, he's gone. Like, I yeah, mean, yeah, he yeah. does some things on Instagram, but like, I don't have time for that. You know, yeah. I love, I mean, I loved his conversations. Like I, like I listened to that one he did with, with Ross, like two times. Yeah. 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 I was just utterly fascinated by, yeah. Yeah. by the conversation. Um, so I, I really, I really mesh with Eric the way he thinks. And I think that's partly generational. I think he's done a wonderful job of kind of articulating things for us Gen Xers who get kind of lost in the shuffle between the boomers and the, and the millennials and, and all his talk about, you know, the, you know, all of his little funny acronyms I find really helpful and useful. Um, but, but I, you know, kind of like you, I kind of miss, I kind of miss these guys. Yeah. Like I, I don't, you know, I certainly miss Peterson. Um, yeah. Well, and, and I wonder, you know, is, is, I thought his conversation with Douthat was just, I, I, you know, I, I've, I listened, I've listened to that a number of times. Yeah. Yeah. Really. But Douthat too has, I mean, his book on, on, on decadence just, just really grabbed me. Yeah. And of course, I've been I've been looking at the Stephen Smith Douthat piece a few times, and and one of the things Douthat says in that conversation, which which has really clung to me, I've had a I've just been busy with my day job lately, so I haven't done enough monologue videos lately. But well, that that day job thing, oh, yeah, yeah, that day job <laughs> thing, yeah, the, <laughs> um, yeah, I know, I have, and I, I don't want to give up my, I mean, because and and it actually impacts this because it. it the thing that Douth had said in that in that piece at the American Enterprise Institute was, you know, if Marianne Williamson had lived in the 19th century, she would have started a church yeah, because that, that is the the church Protestant church. thing to do, yeah. and and there's and I think that that very deeply connects with your piece and it's happening in the Christian Reformed Church. Evangelicalism, of course, is not a church. It's a, you know, like talking to the, the conversation I posted today with Jess, because why wham, something like these parachurches are, you know, they're not a church, but now, so, you know, and especially in something, you know, I, I, I had caught on earlier that you know, because it's not like evangelicals don't have their own sex scandals. I actually have a copy of mm -hmm. uh, Ted Haggard's um, cover of Christianity Today and on, on my wall in my office, a new kind of evangelical. And it's like, oh boy, I, I, I kept that cover because of course everything that had happened. Yeah, yeah. And, but, but yet the, you know, what's gone on in terms of the, the, the Roman Catholic priests, obviously with the theology of the church impacts it in a way that, that it doesn't with Protestants because since Luther there's always been a sense with Protestants that the, the, this institutional thing, which has developed, which develops a culture of ladder climbing yeah, yeah. and political appeasement mm -hmm. and, you know, looking, you know, protecting the brand at all cost. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is something that obviously because of Roman Catholic theology as the scandals of this nature make, you know, and then I read your piece and it's like, I, I completely understand where this well, is well, coming from. Yeah. Because, because like with Catholics, you know, the, 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 the responsibility for the brand really gets kicked up to a celibate cast. Right. And, you know, it almost essentially defined by the fact that they're celibate. Right. So they, any children that they have have to be uh, conscripted 
right? Because, you know, a priest can't make their own, right? Um, and, and so sex is- And is they're always, called father. <laughs> right, 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 right. And, and it, it could be, so I, so I think the sex thing is absolutely front and center, you know? Um, and so, you know, and, you know, and, Luther and, and 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 those in his wake obviously preached, you know, many quivers in the many quivers in the bow, and that was a major sort of, I don't want to say talking point, but you'll know, you'll allow me that major talking point for for the reformers was sort of these large families, and it, it's always funny how that always kind of follows movements, right? It's like we're just going to make more of us, you know, and 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 expand the tribe, you know, that way. So I think I think most people. Think, look at the celibate priesthood always with that kind of raised eyebrow. And I, and I would say that, and it's certainly, you know, even sort of, you know, red blooded American Catholic males sort of always sort of like, well, that's, it's kind of weird, right? I mean, you know, in, in uh, I teach Dubliners, Joyce's Dubliners every year, and there's the, an opening story where you've got these two guys who are talking about the boy who has a friendship with the priest, and they're just like, I don't know, it's just, it's just weird, you know? And, and like, I swear I hear the same kind of conversations even now. I mean, if anybody even cared anymore, but that, that's, that's mm. yet another wrinkle to, to mm. the story. But, but I think that the, the sex thing is front and center precisely because um, priests aren't supposed to have it, <laughs> you know, and that, 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 that burden for replication, again, I'm you sort of using evolutionary terms here, you know, the burden, you know, sort of rests in the memes, not the genes, you yeah. know? Yeah. Well, and, and, and even, and I don't know much about, you know, Roman Catholic trads, but, You know, in, in some ways, the Protestant Reformation, and I loved, I loved the conversation I had with Brett Sockold, and I loved his book because it just sort of opened my eyes to, to seeing, you know, Luther, you know, at least according to Brett, Luther trying to discover what Aquinas knew, but all of the history between Aquinas and Luther made Aquinas obscure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and then no, that comes fun. through then with Calvin in the real presence, yeah. because, you know, I, I got into this because, again, a friend who's been on my channel, Len Van Der Zee, wrote this book, you it's know, Christ, ba Christ ba by IVP, Christ's okay, yeah. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, yeah. where he, Len is a, such an interesting guy because he, he, he's been on so many different, um, when, in, when I was in seminary, uh, at Calvin Seminary, I I don't even remember how on earth I got roofed. It. But basically, I had to do a conference or something. And 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 Luce Meads, who never taught at Calvin Seminary, but taught at Calvin College and went on to teach at Fuller Seminary. Mm. And Fuller, Luce, oh yes. Yeah, so Luce oh, Meads, Luce Meads, very interesting guy. He He eventually, so at Fuller, John Wimber, this is going to connect with your Catholic or the, the charismatic um, piece of your story. John Wimber, I don't, do you know who John Wimber is? I don't know. Sorry. So no. This is, this is what is so interesting is that, you know, you're, you're a bit younger than I am, but not a whole lot younger. So we got a fair amount of overlap. And yeah. so John Wimber was a Presbyterian who also had a, you know, very much a charismatic revival in his life. And he went on to write books like Power Evangelism and Power Healing, mm -hmm. and eventually taught a class, he and some others taught a class at Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, where they were teaching seminarians the practice of, of basically facilitating divine healing in people. And, yeah, yeah. and what's interesting to me about this is that, you know, because the, the Roman Catholic Church is so ancient, I mean, yeah. you have rights for exorcism. And I mean, this is all built in and, and has not been lost, whereas Protestants are such creatures of the moment so often that, so here, here at Fuller Seminary, they're having this class on, on signs and wonders. And, and then Lou Smeads write, writes a little pamphlet basically is it always is it always proper to celebrate a miracle because they're they're processing this now north of us in reading there's a whole new thing with the this with the bethel church 
going on, not a CRC church, but an evangelical church. But anyway, so, so Len Vanderzee, we got, I asked my pastor, Dave Beelan, who was sort of on the charismatic edge of the Christian Reformed Church at that time, you know, who should, who should I get to talk at this conference? And he said, oh, get Len Vanderzee. So Len talks at that. And then Len um, also in many ways was a, was spearheaded the, the, the Reformed Catholic thing. And now he goes to uh, Church of the Servant, which is one of the most liturgical, uh, neo-sacramental Christian Reformed churches, but right next to Calvin College. But they're also sort of on the cusp of the LGBT conversations in this year. I mean, it's just, uh, so Len has always been there. Yeah, so but, that's interesting, because when I, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, so, so. I was just going to say, you know, when, when I was out in California, you know, I knew a bunch of Fuller people, and they were right on the, I, they were right on the verge of, of really getting into the woke stuff, you know, early on, you know, and, and I found that to be very fascinating because I knew they were going to lose and lose fast to the woke stuff, hmm. you know, and, and, you know, what I found it interesting is that, you know, places like Fuller, if I understand my American Protestant history, places like Fuller rose up originally as an antidote to the sort of progressivism of the mainline churches, right? Right. right. So then they've just done, done, done their own version of that literally in the last 15 years. Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, and Fuller, Fuller is sort of on the cusp of that because that war has basically been going on in Fuller because so Richard Mao, who was from the Christian Reformed Church, he was a philosophy professor of mine at Calvin College, went on to be president at Fuller Seminary and now Mark Laberton is president and he's, you know, they've, they've, they held a pretty hard line on the LGBT stuff, but now the woke stuff is, is yeah. making all of this far more complex again. So it's a back door. I mean, you know, that, that, that's a back door. It, it, you know, my, my completely, you know, I don't have any skin in this game in, directly, but that, that's just another way of getting at it, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, well, and, and, you know, but then of course, you know, on your side of the line, Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> and John I mean, Kerry like, a generation ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's the thing, you know, uh, the, the, the Cardinal uh, Archbishop of Chicago, maybe he's not a Cardinal yet, but Supich, he just came out this past Sunday and was castigating all of the conservatives and the trads that would dare question, you know, um, anyone's sort of, you know, real Catholicism, right? And so it's always this sort of question that hovers, like, well, are you really, you know, the thing? Are you really Catholic? Is he a real Catholic or a fake Catholic? Well, what does that even mean? Like, is he a real Christian or is he a fake Christian? Like, what does that even mean, right? And so, you know, at, you know, when does orthodoxy matter? Right, I mean, like, what, what, are, what are the contours? What are the boundaries? You know, when is orthodoxy permeable and when is it not? And, and, and we're constantly sorting this out, right? And, you know, I, you, you bring Holland's book up uh, a bit and I, I read it uh, again recently. And, you know, what, what I found so um, wonderful, frankly, about Holland's book, um, I worried that maybe it confirms my priors a little bit too much, but, um, but, but it, it's such an eccentric retelling of a history that I basically know. Yeah. Like I, I'm certainly, you know, probably a little bit better read than the average Catholic. And I'm pretty familiar with the, gro the broad scope of, of, of the way that Catholics tell church history. And to watch him tell the story was just fascinating to me. You know, it's always a slightly, slightly different emphasis. And so then all of a sudden, all these things open up. And so I'll give you an example. So reading about the Gregorian reforms, you know, uh, where, you know, you know, no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, you know, growing up, I didn't really think much of it. But if I did, you know, I was like, oh, like, that's the sort of the, the pronouncement of a strong and robust church who's sort of telling the people like it is. And now upon rereading it, maybe or reseeing it at, at the age of 47, I'm like, Oh, that's the kind of stuff you say when you're weak. That's the kind of stuff when you have real doubts about the veracity of what you're saying. And so, you know, talk about a, a, a paradigm explosion, right? Yeah. I mean, and um, anyway, I don't know why I went down that, that rabbit hole. No, I, yeah, <laughs> for good. Well, well, 
you know, and, and when you talk about Orthodox, I mean, because Protestants, in a sense, said, okay, well, we'll, we'll not worry about the, ins well, we'll, we'll start our own, inst we'll, we'll start our own institution, but, and, yeah. and we'll make Orthodoxy itself, we'll make it the, we'll make assent and, and to the psychological, the thought of it itself, that's what, that's what will make the thing itself, that's what will make yes. it, it itself. Yeah. And and so, you know, I, I really feel for the trads because where on earth do you go? What on earth do you do when 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 it's when you're when you're in the kind of position they're at? And I, I loved how you described, you know, imagining, okay, I mean it's it's the winner's dilemma. Because once you win, now you have the terror of what if we what if having won we lose it? Because that's that's <laughs> worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about the winner's dilemma? I love it. it it's well. So I, I was talking to well, I was talking to Jess again. The po the the conversation I posted today, and he, he was talking about the pressure he felt as a kid when every all these evangelicals would say things like and and you've got so many more advantages than we had. And then when he basically is in the deconstruction point of his life, he's like. And I just gave up the inheritance. I just I I inherited the kingdom and I squandered it. I am the I am the prodigal son that you know lost that lost the father's money in dissipation yeah. and I'm looking hungrily at that pig slump. And in, in your circles, Paul, in your circles, do 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 folks talk about um, Ricoeur's concept of the second naivete? No. Have you heard of this concept? No might be worth looking into he sort of talks about like you have a naivete as a child right and and then you spend much of your childhood blowing up that naivete that you had you yeah. had um inherited i guess yeah and then you have to kind of put it all back together again mm -hmm. and now i i, I i'm no recour uh specialist but but the, the phrase has always stuck with me because I find myself in that sort of situation, right? Especially being on the other side of, moder of, of modernity and modernism. And, and, and I know that modernism means a bunch of different things in a, in a, in, in a, in a couple of different contexts. And that's probably important to, to, to maintain those distinctions. But modernism, of course, in, in the church tradition is, is pretty clear. And on the other side of modernism now, you know, it, it's done its thing, it's wrecked it's wrecked everything, right? And, you know, and so the version of this in Catholic circles, and I don't know if this happens in, in, in Protestant circles, but, you know, you go on the Sunday in which they're talking about the miracle of the, the loaves and the fishes or the feeding of the, of, of the, of the 5,000. And, and invariably, you're going to get some version of like, well, well, kids, you know, the real miracle is a miracle of sharing, right? <laughs> and, and, um, and, other, and I'm just not original to me. I, other people have talked and joked about that. And it's like it's in the yeah, movie I, Millions. It's right there in the right, movie. Right, right, right. <laughs> and 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 it's so dumb. I, you know, it it. And yet, you know, that just that that kind of you know, and this is what I'm going to get snide about. You know, okay, boomer, right? Um, and you know, but but that's so dumb. Like like the the fruit of that church is death. Like it doesn't exist anymore, right? And so that's why I'm, as this sort of weird Gen Xer, I've inherited modernity, right? So I haven't inherited tradition in the same way because I'm purely post-conciliar. And I've inherited a, a heap of ashes. You know, and so what, what, what am I supposed to give to my kids? Like I'm not gonna give you know, to my kids, well, the real miracle is one of sharing. You know, it's like, no, because that's not true. Like that, that's not, Hold on one second, I'm gonna shut the door. Hey guys, Hannah, Hannah, I'm in the middle of my podcast. Can you, can you just be quiet? All right. Sorry, no problem. Um, so, um, you know, so, so that, that sort of, that was probably like me bleeding on the page is like, yeah. you know, yeah. it's not making sense to yeah. me. And yeah. part of it is anger, Paul. I mean, I'm angry yeah. that I mean, look at if, if you look at the the my journey that I chart in the in the, I don't really get too much into it because I didn't want to bore the, the the readers. But you know, I'm a product of Catholic education all the way you know through high school and, and eventually in college again. But high school and like I knew nothing, I knew absolutely nothing. Yeah. You know, not only was it true that I basically didn't know scripture, but I didn't even know any 
there was no catechism. You know, it was basically Jesus loves you, which is good, right? That, but like, that's it. It was MTD through and through before it had a, before it had a title, it was MTD. And so, so any, any knowledge that I have of, of, of my inheritance is I've scrounged for it on my own, you know, in the libraries and in the nooks and crannies of, you know, and so, so you've got a, a completely um, drained out um, intellectual inheritance. And if you're liturgically minded, you know, if you've ever seen, a, a, you know, a, a modern mass and a traditional mass, it's like, is this the same? How can this be the same church? Mm. Right? And that's the kind of thing that I avoided thinking about for years and years and years. Like, yeah, fine. My local suburban parish is a, is a, is a, is a clown show dumpster fire, but at least the church has got like the thing and I can look at documents and it can be weird and, and all of that. And, and now like, you're like, wait, it's all a clown show. It's all, you know, wow. 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 That's going to be a clip. That was, Oh, no, no, but that, that, that's so. But yeah, that's yeah, so yeah. helpful to me because I, again, I'm I'm about ten years older, and of course, so I talked to a, a, Eric's been on my show. He he planted a church in in Davis, which is you know university town, just just yeah, near yeah. here. And he yeah. came in, and you know, so he's Eric is twenty years younger than I am, uh, or something, you know, almost twenty years perhaps, but. This is so fascinating to me because we we don't because that that tradition. So so the video that I haven't made this week, the the one I want to make it, I haven't had time to make this week, um, is all about the the symbols and how these the, even the word symbol isn't doesn't really cut it because obviously in in a in in a traditional mass it's. Well, and, and, I mean, and, and from a Protestant point of view, the, the, the knock was always, well, the people, the people don't understand it. Yeah. Right. Uh, which, of yeah, course, so, would be the Protestant knock. Yeah, right. So, so right. So, for me, so a, a massive part of my own education in this, right? I mean, we're really talking about sacramental realities, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that the world is a sign of, of, of these yeah. other things, and not yeah. just the world. But, but, you know, I remember, so when I was a sophomore in college, really one of the reasons why I went to the college is they had a Rome program and I had never, I, I had been in a plane once, I think, to go to Disney World when I was, before I went to college. And um, so I had not been out of the country. And so when I was, so when I was 20, 21, I was 20, maybe 19. And I, you know, I, I go to Rome and it was a semester long program and it was a great program. And, you know, I'm not really sure what I thought about time. I'm not really sure what I thought about 2000 years. Um, but all, when you go to Rome, you're like, oh, like this stuff is old, really old. And, and the, the oddity of course, is that the church in Rome is new. <laughs> you know, I remember this one day, this really blew my mind, telescope my sense of time and space. I'm, I'm sitting in a church in Rome on a Sunday, I was going to my, my Sunday mass and it's in Italian, but you could follow along, right? And it's a place called Santa Maria in Trastevere. And Santa Maria in Trastevere is what they call a titular church, which means it was one of the original churches of the Roman, of the Roman population. It was an old house that, that eventually, and so they built a church on top of it and there are miracles that are attached to it and all of that. But at any rate, um, as it happened that Wednesday before mass, I had gone to, on an art and architecture tour and they were telling us about the columns and this, that, and the other and whatnot. And so anyway, I'm sitting at mass then this Sunday and I'm thinking, cause I don't know Italian. So I'm just kind of thinking and praying and doing my thing. And um, I look at the columns and I hear the voice of my teacher saying, and the columns, you know, are taken from the Roman forum. And, and, and it, the thought occurred to me so that the columns in this church are older than Jesus. Like, and then you just sort of, you know, your mind just does this, like, wow, you know, it's a long time. Like, the church is old. Uh, and, and the tradition, and I don't mean, you know, just the Roman Catholic Church, but just our church, you know, is old. It's, it's, it's ancient, you know. And I, um, and I remember uh, 
another story that kind of gets at this time thing. Chesterton writes in his um, book about St. Francis, I don't know if you've ever read it, but it's a wonderful book. I really recommend it. But Francis steps into a church that is as old to him hmm. as France is to us. Hmm. <laughs> you know, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. like that, that's old and long, you know, and, and, and so that really gave me a, I mean, that really cured me any, any vestiges of my um, belief that, you know, um, the sort of the myth of progress was shattered in that moment because you look at these churches, right? You know, you look at these churches and I grew up in the American churches in the post conciliar church in which, you know, I went to churches that looked more like the church you probably grew up in than anything that I saw in Italy. And you look at those churches, you're like, wow, like they all mean something, right? I mean, you know, like every church in Rome, it's got, you know, it's got the, the lion, the young man, the bull, you know, it's got the four, everything means something. It's got seven candles for the seven churches of, of you know, and, and everything, it's, it's, everything's lifted right out of the apocalypse everything, all the iconography and all of it means something, right? And, and so the, 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 so that I had to learn really what sacramentality was and, and how sacramentality means something in space and in time. And, and therefore, when, when Peterson, for instance, talks about the cross as being the center of meaning and where these, all these, inter, these things intersect, I always think of Eliot and, you know, the, the, the four quartets and, and you know, the, 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 the still point of the turning world. Well, like in Catholic iconography, the altar is at the still point of the turning world where the ultimate sacrifice is made. And, yeah. you know, and then you hear Peterson riff on sacrifice. I mean, look, I grew up, you know, you, you understanding you know, the holy sacrifice of the math, like mass, you, know, you don't really think of the words, right? And to have him talk about what sacrifice actually means, especially when he's talking about Abraham and Isaac, and I think it's five and six of the biblical series, you're like, oh, and like, what's crazy to me, Paul, is like, I read this stuff, like I read Gerard, and I read, you know, Eliade and, and, and all the stuff that he talked about. And then you're like, oh, but I, 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 can, I can now kind of see it again. And maybe that's why I like Peterson so much is that he's given me eyes to see again. Hmm. You, you know, stripped of, of, of all the crap that, you know, uh, the, the modernist accretions or something like that. Well, and how did he do that? This, this guy who, the, you know, that, that's, that's this, this guy who, you know, has been on this, has been on this quest. And of course, you know, you, I watch him go right to the line of, you know, with the resurrection and Sam Harris kind of yeah. bullies him. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But how does, you know, how does he, how does he do that? How does he do that? And, and where do, I mean, and the other question I have just listening to you is, you know, where do you, where do you go? I mean, I'm, it, it's, again, getting back to the institutional thing, because, you know, there are a, a few, I, I was just talking to a woman in my church, who, and she says, I listened to all your videos. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, oh, no. yeah. And, uh, but, you know, where do you go? Because you, you mentioned, you know, you, you write a piece like this, which yeah. probably more people, because, of course, Dreer picked it up and, and put yeah. it out. Yeah. Way more people read that and have this, their only picture of you is this window into you brought by that piece. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you show up for mass and you teach in a Catholic school. And so, you know, and I, I deal with the same thing, but in some ways it's a little bit easier as a Protestant because we're always sort of chafing against the institution. You're Maybe you're you're always protesting, right? I mean, yeah, we're always protesting. Mark's I'm always sure. in front of you, right, Paul? So, I mean, yeah, I'm not um, sure it's terribly healthy, but yeah, there no, we no, are. I know, I know. I just, yeah, I, I know, right? Um, so, uh, so I don't know, Paul. That, like, that, that, I mean, you know, I, I didn't write the piece with answers. I, I, I wrote the piece because I have real questions, and I don't know why. Like when I take my dogs on a walk every morning at 5 a.m., I listen to Peterson podcasts or Weinstein podcasts. You know, I don't listen to um, church stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and 
And when I listen to Baron now, I want to throw my iPad across the room because I know the kind of passive aggressive game I feel like he's playing. And it's a lot uglier. It's a lot uglier than it looks on the surface. I mean, you know, they are closing ranks right now. I mean, Paul, when, when did the McCarrick thing break? Do you, have, do, you have, do you know what I'm talking about? When did it break? I don't, I don't, it, I did. Over, I did. over two years ago. Wow. And they promised the report any day now. Yeah. And they've been playing the game like, oh, no, next month. Oh, no, in six months. Oh, and you're like, stop it. Like, I'm an adult. Yeah. You know, and, and it would be nice to have adult conversations. You know, so when I, when I listen, you know, to Jordan Peterson have a throwdown with Sam, it's like, at the very least, it's an adult conversation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and when I hear Heather and Brett do their thing about whatever it is they're talking about, like it's an adult conversation. Yeah. You know, they have their own blind spots and they, they frustrate me, you know, because, you know, but, but I'm not having, you know, those kind of adult conversations with, I mean, they wouldn't even talk to me. I mean, you've quipped about this before. I mean, who are you? I mean, they're not, I mean, you know, I can't talk to the bishop. Hmm. What, what would I say? Yeah. You know, um, you know, but, but yet, you know, I, 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 I believe in Jesus. Uh, you know, I believe in the sacraments. I believe that when I go, when I, you know, drag the kids out of bed and drag them up to mass in masks these days, you know, that, that, that I'm in the presence of the Lord, like literally. And so I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Um, but, but my sense is that it's not like I think that Peterson's going to save the church, right? I'm not right. saying that the blind sides are going to save right. the church. I, I don't, I don't, but they've certainly given me some strength of heart that the way that I make sense out of the world can be bolstered or emboldened or, 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 or betrayed or strengthened by me listening to Eric go off on one of his weirdo cool riffs about <laughs> blues music or, you know, whatever it might be, you know, it's like those things, those things, they, they, they give me, and, and like with Peterson in particular, you're like, man, all these things I, I, that, I, I, that I know through theology and, and, and scripture, and philosophy, like he's giving me, like he's firming up my foundations, you know, in, in a very real way. And he sort of came up to that edge in his, there, his conversation he had with you. He said, well, of course I, I won't go over that line because then I'd lose three fourths of my audience. Yeah. It was a pretty cagey moment for, for, yeah. for, for him there. Yeah. You know, and I think there's a lot going on, you know, he, I, you know, I think he knows what he's doing on some real level, but, but anyway, uh, so I don't know where that, that, that sort of leads me, you know, so I'm going to try to write this piece on Peterson and what the trads can learn from him. You know, what the trad, I mean, I, I think the funniest piece will be Heather and Eric, uh, Heather and Brad and then Eric. I mean, my gosh, they're going to, you know, who knows? I mean, I, I might really get kicked out of the tribe then, <laughs> um, but, but I know, I know that they have something important that we need. Like they're having conversations about very important things that, that we need, you know? Um, yeah, I, I, I do. I do. Um, and it's not, and it's not dependent upon being in the good graces of the Bishop. Right. Right. Um, and that's part of my, you know, and I chafe about up against this too. Like, you know, I teach at a Catholic school. I, I don't want to cause trouble to my headmaster. No. And, you know, and that's why I'm, you know, I'm, I've been pretty good today. Um, uh, but, you know, that, that, that's a real, that's a real concern, you sure. know, but, but like you, I mean, and, you know, I, I love teaching. I mean, I really love teaching and, and um, I hope I get to keep doing it. I mean, we'll see what happens. I, 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 I suspect you're very good at it. That, that comes through. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. Well, I've, I've pestered you with my own curiosity. Anything in our time remaining that you wanted to touch on that we didn't? 
my gosh, I could talk to you for, for days. Uh, I mean, I really would love, uh, you know, at, at some point, I, I, I'm really interested in your, your sort of what you think is going to go on with post being after modernism, not being postmodern, but being after modernism. Part of me suspects, though, like everything's kind of on hold right now. Yeah. And we, we see if we can have life past November, what is it, 7th? I mean, I just get this sense that yeah. everything is going to be really bad. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, until we can get, get past this election. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not a, not a hugely political person, but, but it's just, it's sucking all the air out of every room I, I walk into. And this sort of great awakening is, is no, no exception. I, I don't know what, I don't know what either path looks like depending on I, which one wins. I, yeah. I just have, it's, it's difficult. It's so difficult to know as much as I, um, well, here again, Peterson is prophetic, right? If you remember, he was on Maher after yeah. first election. He's yeah. like, how are you all going to live with each other? Yeah. And, and yeah. he was right. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, and, you, know, you know, he said, yeah, you, so you, you, you think all these things. You think he's basically Hitler, you know, with a comb over. And maybe he <laughs> is, right? But, but how are you going to live with half the country, you know, yeah. who thinks you're the problem and, and vice versa? So, I mean... Look, if Biden wins, we lose. If Trump wins, we lose. I don't. I don't know how we we we, we you know we, we survive past it. But that's a sort of dark musings on a Tuesday afternoon. Is it Tuesday? Yeah. You know. So um, no, it's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the dark musings on a Wednesday afternoon after a long day of faculty meetings. I should say. <laughs> <laughs> are you having? Are you having in person? We are. Yeah, we're starting on the fourteenth. Uh, we already have a bunch of kids. We're a boarding school, so we already have uh, uh, 35 kids um, quarantining with us. Okay. Uh, we bring them meals and the whole thing. So, yeah, we're going to be able to start hopefully on the 14th, and who knows? Who knows? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's fat. Well, well, we'll have to talk again. And, I'd love to. Uh, yeah, this has been fantastic, Paul. I really appreciate your time. I, I, I've been watching you early on, um, early on, um, since I stumbled upon Peterson after the Newman, the Kathy Newman stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, I think I watched, uh, the interview he did with the, the, the Danish guy. Yeah. Um, it's very was, interesting. That interview. was the one that, that really opened up Peterson to me because at that point I just thought he was a, a, a suspended conservative academic who was cranky about political correctness. And like, I'm glad he's sort of doing that, but I didn't care about that stuff. But when I right. saw that interview, yeah. like, okay, there's some real stuff going on with this guy that I have to take him seriously. And then I, I think I even probably Googled, you know, Christians and Peterson. I think you popped up. That's how I, 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 um, I, I summoned upon your channel. So thank you for your channel and thank you for your work. Well, thank you for, thank you for watching and listening and, and for the conversation because, you know, we're, we're at one of these moments in history where, People paying attention, I think, have the understanding that, well, maybe, maybe if the, maybe if the script, maybe if anybody paying attention knows that there's no obvious script moving forward, uh, it's just a little bit uh, either easier or more tempting to imagine that there is a script writer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, which is ironic because some would say, no, that's the argument for there being no script writer, but. Who knows? Yeah, you, you, see, you and I are in the same spot, right? I mean, that's and that's what that's like my frustrations with Verveke, and, and you know, it's like and 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 uh, you you quipped about this the other the rebel wisdom guys. It's like they're just allergic to Jesus. They just can't. <laughs> you can't possibly entertain that Jesus might be real. Uh -huh. You know, and it, and well, it's like, an well, audacious thought. I mean, I gotta course, I gotta crazy. respect them for it. Because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, for sure. I, I but but it's like you can entertain the what if. I mean, look, if I have to entertain the what if on the other side. Yeah, yeah. I, I figure you could give it a shot here. You know? Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's where I finally land because it's like, okay, well, there's a lot of unknowns. I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd rather opt. I'd rather lean this way with my unknowns than the other. And so we're yeah. back to Pascal, right? Yeah, back to Pascal. Well, thank you so much, Kale. This, is, this has been an absolute delight. And God bless you. Please pray for me. I have to write these articles. So I'll pray for your work. Uh, all right. Well, I look forward to them. All right. All right. Be well. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.